The Penitential Theodori, also known as the Udicha Theodori or Canones Theodori, is an early medieval penitential handbook based on the judgments of Archbishop Theodore of Canterbury. It exists in multiple versions, the fullest and historically most important of which is the U or Discipulus Umbrensium version, hereafter the Penitential Umbrens, composed probably in Northumbria within approximately a decade or two after Theodore's death. Other early though far less popular versions are those known today as the Capitula Dasheriana, the Canones Gregory, the Canones Basilienses, and the Canones Cotoniani, all of which were compiled before the Penitential Umbrense probably in either Ireland and or England during or shortly after Theodore's lifetime. <laughs> Background it is generally accepted by scholars today that Theodore himself is not responsible for any of the penitential works ascribed to him. Rather, a certain associate of Theodore's named Eoda is generally regarded as the point of dissemination of certain judgments proffered by Theodore in an unofficial context and in response to questions put to him by students at his Canterbury school regarding proper ecclesiastical organization and discipline. Topic: <laughs> Authorship and structure. Topic. Topic. Capitula Dasheriana Topic. Scholars have for some time accepted that the Capitula Dasheriana represents the earliest attempt to assemble together Theodorian penitential judgments. The case for the Capitula Dasheriana as an Irish production has been argued most effectively by Thomas Charles Edwards, who noticed, first, that the Capitula Dasheriana lacks any obvious structural framework. For Charles Edwards, this feature, or rather lack of a feature is symptomatic of the non-Roman character of the Capitula Dasheriana, and thus suggests its creation outside of Theodore's immediate circle, and perhaps even outside of the Rome-oriented Anglo-Saxon Church. Whether or not this is true, there are other, strong signs that the Capitula Dasheriana was produced in ecclesiastical circles that had rather less connection to Theodore's Canterbury than with Irish and Celtic centres. Specifically, the Capitula Dasheriana has both textual and literary connections with 8th-century Irish and or Breton canonical activities. The Capitula Dasheriana is witnessed today by two 10th-century manuscripts produced in Brittany. Ludwig Bieler has shown that the copyists of both manuscripts derived their text of the Capitula Dasheriana from the same 8th century collection of Irish materials that was still resident in Brittany in the 10th century a collection that also included or was at least closely associated with the Collectio Canonum Hibernensis. The A recension of the Collectio Canonum Hibernensis, believed to have been compiled before 725, is the earliest work known to have drawn on the Penitential Theodori tradition, relying on none other than the Capitula Dasheriana version. From this it appears that the Capitula Dasheriana was assembled perhaps as early as a decade after Theodore's death in 690, and certainly no later than the first quarter of the 8th century. It was very possibly compiled in Ireland though possibly instead in an Anglo-Irish or Breton milieu, and was used shortly after its creation as a source for the Collectio Canonum Hibernensis, which would itself even very soon after its creation go on to influence powerfully the developing canon law and penitential traditions in Francia. Canones <coughs> Gregory <coughs> 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 Canones Basilienses Canones Cotoniani Penitential Umbrens the Penitential Umbrense is a selection of canons from the earlier Capitula Dasheriana, Canones Gregory, Canones Cotoniani and Canones Basilienses, along with additional Theodorian judgments that were obtained by a mysterious figure named Eoda Christianus. As we learn in the preface to the Penitential Umbrense, these latter judgments were proffered by the Archbishop in answer to questions raised by rulings found in a certain Irish document. Libellus Scotorum, a work that is commonly believed to be the Penitential Cumiani. 
All of this material has been arranged by the author of the Penitentiel Umbrense according to topic, with occasional commentary and additional rulings added in by the author of the Penitentiel Umbrense himself. The Penitentiel Umbrense is thus far more organized than its predecessors, and owing to its contents derived from EODA and the libelous Scotorum also includes more content that is strictly penitential in nature. The identity of the author is controversial. In the prologue or rather dedicatory letter to the penitential umbrense the author identifies himself as a discipulus umbrensium, a student of the North Umbrians. Whether this identifies the author's nationality, or merely his academic affiliation, is unclear, and several interpretations of its meaning have been advanced. Felix Lieberman believed that the Discipulus was an Irish disciple of Theodore, while Paul Finsterwalder argued that the Discipulus was a man, Irish born though trained in Anglo Saxon schools, who worked on the continent, probably within the context of Willibird's continental mission. A year after they were published, Finsterwalder's conclusions were roundly rejected by Wilhelm Levison, who argued that the Penitential Umbrense was the work of an Anglo Saxon working in England. Scholars since have generally sided with Levison in viewing the penitential umbrense as the product of Anglo-Saxon England, and more specifically of a student working in Northumbria. The penitential umbrense survives in two forms, a full form and a half form. The full form is clearly the more original work, the half form being simply the last 14 topics or chapters or the full form. The full form itself survives in slightly different versions. In the earliest of these the work is divided into 29 chapters though the Fulda recension discussed below divides the work slightly differently and into 28 chapters. These are 1. On drunkenness 2. On fornication 3. On theft 4. On manslaughter 5. On heretics lit. Those deceived by heresy 6. On perjury 7. On diverse evils, and on actions that are not culpable because necessary or accidental quae non nocent necessary. 8. On the ways in which clerics can do wrong. 9. On those who should be defrocked, and those who cannot be ordained. 10. On the twice baptized and how they may do penance. 11. On those who do not honor the Lord's Day and hold ecclesiastical fasts in contempt. 12. On Eucharistic communion and the sacrifice. 13. On the public reconciliation of penitents. 14. On penance specific to those in Christian marriage. 15. On the worship of idols and demons. 16. On church administration and church building. 17. On the three principal ecclesiastical grades, i.e., bishops, priests, and deacons. 18. On ordinations of bishops, priests, deacons, monks, abbots, abbesses, nuns, virgins, widows, etc. 19. On baptism and confirmation 20. On the Mass for the Dead 21. On abbots, monks and the monastery 22. On rites performable by women, and on their ministry in the Church 23. On different customs among Greeks and Romans 24. On the communion of the Irish and British, who do not keep Easter or the tonsure according to Catholic custom 25. On the mentally ill lit. Those troubled by a devil. 26. On the use and avoidance of animals for food 27. On questions pertaining to marriage 28. On servants 29. On diverse questions A later version of the full form has these 29 chapters divided into two books, with chapters 1-15 comprising the first book and chapters 16-29 renumbered as cc. 1-14 comprising the second. Up until recently, scholars had assumed that the two-book version of the full form was the original version of the Penitential Umbrense. Accordingly all previous editors Wasserschelben, Haddon Stubbs and Finsterwalder have printed the two-book version, and all previous scholarship has been predicated on the assumption that the author of the Penitential Umbrense created a work divided into two books. Several scholars even claim to have detected a generic division between the two books, noting that many of the subjects covered in the first book drunkenness, fornication, pagan practices, etc. are those typically associated with the penitential genre, while many of the subjects in the second book church administration, ordination, baptism are those typically dealt with in canon law collections. 
It has been supposed that this is because the author of the Penitential Umbrense wished to divide the chapters of his source material i.e. the Capitula Dasharyana and the Canones Griogri into those of a penitential nature equals book 1 and those of a canonical nature equals book 2. However, it now seems more likely that the more noticeably penitential nature of the first 15 chapters is due not to the author specific desire to front load his work with exclusively penitential material, but rather to his decision to incorporate into pre-existing collections of Theodorian canons equals the Capitula Dasharyana and the Canones Griogri the newly acquired canons obtained from EODA. As described above, the material that the Discipulus had managed to obtain probably indirectly from EODA was based largely on Theodore s responses to rulings found in the Penitential Cumiani. All such material from the Penitential Cumiani is indeed found in chapters 2-14 of the Penitential Umbrance. The highly penitential nature of chapters 2-14 is therefore merely an accident of the Discipulus's decision to treat first those subjects touched on by his EODA, Penitential Cumiani material, namely the traditionally penitential subjects of fornication, theft, manslaughter and marriage. Beyond this there was apparently no attempt on the part of the discipulus to treat penitential subjects in the first fifteen chapters and canonical ones in the last fourteen. Indeed, the last fifteen chapters equals book two treats several subjects aligned strongly with the penitential genre, for example food avoidance, marital relations and mental illness, while Book 1 contains chapters dealing with subjects more commonly associated with canon law collections, namely baptism, heresy, and ordination. Neither do the sources used by the author of the Penitential Umbrense give any indication of a generic division between its first and second halves, for a great many canonical sources i.e. papal decretals and ancient Eastern conciliar canons are drawn upon in the first half. It now seems that in its original form the Penitential Umbrense was a 29-chapter work and that the two-book version was a later development. The earliest manuscripts—which also happened to transmit the oldest textual variants—witness to a work divided into 29 chapters, while it is only two later manuscripts—which also contain patently more recent textual variants—in which the Penitential Umbrense appears as a work divided into two books. It is also now clear that the passage from the prologue commonly used to defend to idea that the work was originally divided into two works has been misinterpreted. The prologue runs as follows, with the relevant portion in bold. A student in Northumbria, humbly, to all Catholics in England, particularly to the doctors of souls, salutary redemption in Christ the Lord. First of all, I have, dear brothers, held it a worthy enough thing to lay bare to your love's blessedness whence I have gathered the poultices of this medicine which follows, lest, as often happens, through copyists' decrepitude or carelessness that law lex should be left hideously confused which God once, in a figurative way, handed down through his first legislator and ultimately to the fathers de secundo patribus in order that they might make it known to their sons, so that the following generation might learn of it, namely penance, which the Lord Jesus, after being baptized, proclaimed to us. Us, having as yet no medicine, as above all the substance pray omnibus instrumentum of his teaching, saying, Do you all penance, etc., who for the increase of your felicity deign to guide from the blessed seed of him Ias, i.e. Peter, to whom it is said, Whichever things you set free upon the land will be set free also in the heavens. Him e -u -m -i -e. Theodore, by whom this most helpful salve for wounds would be concocted, tempertor, for I. The Apostle says, have received from the Lord. And I say, dear brothers, with the Lord's favor I have received from you even that which I have given to you. Accordingly, the greater part of these remedies EODA the priest, of blessed memory, known to some as Christianus, is said by trustworthy report to have received under instruction from the venerable master Antestite Theodore. And these are buttressed, in Istorum quoque adminiculum est by what divine grace likewise delivered to our unworthy hands, namely, things which the aforementioned man came to learn from a widely known Irish booklet, concerning which the elder Senex is said to have given this opinion, that an ecclesiastic ecclesiasticus homo was the author of that book. 
Many others also, not only men but also women, enkindled by him with an inextinguishable passion for these remedies, in order to slake their thirst hurried with burning desire to crowd round a person of undoubtedly singular knowledge in our age. Whence there has been found among diverse persons that diverse and confused digest of those rules, composed together with established causes of the second book und et illa diversa confusac digestio regularum illarum constitutus causis libri secundi conscripta inventa est apud diversos. On account of which, brothers, through him who was crucified and who by the shedding of his blood confirmed what mighty things he had preached while living, I beg your love. S. Passus most obliging kindness that, if I have herein perpetrated any misdeed of rashness or negligence, in consideration of the utility of this work, you defend me before him with the merit of your intercessory prayer. I call upon as witness him, the maker of all things, that in so far as I know myself these things I have done for the sake of the kingdom about which he preached. And, as I truly fear, if I do something beyond my talents, yet may the good intentions benevolentia of so necessary a work as this seek from him pardon for my crimes, with you as my advocates, for all of whom equally and without jealousy I labor, in so far as I am able. And from all of those things I have been able to select invenir the more useful topics and compile them together, placing titles before each. For I trust that these things will draw the attention of those of good soul bono animo, concerning whom it is said peace upon the land to people of goodwill. The context makes it obvious that the Libri Secundi highlighted in bold above refers to nothing other than the Scotorum libelis mentioned several times previously. There is thus no need to suppose, and no evidence to support, that the Discipulus composed his work in two books. The two-book version most likely arose under the influence of the canon law collection known as the Collectio Canonum Vetus Gallica. As mentioned above, the penitential umbrent survives in a full form, and in a half-form. So far as can be determined, the half-form first arose in Corby between 725 and 750, when the Vetus Gallica collection was undergoing revision and expansion. Those responsible for revising the Vetus Gallica had not long before acquired a copy of the Penitential Umbrens, which they decided to include in their revised collection. For whatever reason, the Corby revisers were interested only in the final fourteen canons of the Penitential Umbrens, and it was these canons alone that they included in the appendix to the Corby redaction of the Vetus Gallica. Thus began the tradition of the half-form version of the Penitential Umbrens. The Corby redaction of the Vetus Gallica was very successful and very soon after its creation it was enjoying wide circulation in France, Germany, Bavaria and northern Italy. As a result, far more copies of the half-form version of the Penitential Umbrense were read and copied—either as part of the Vetus Gallica appendix or as part of derivative canon law collections—than ever were of the standalone or full-form version. The two-book version of the full form probably only developed after the half form had achieved popularity, that is in the second half of the 8th century or first half of the 9th. Since by then most who knew the penitential umbrens knew it only in its half form version, someone who happened upon the full form which still circulated, though much less widely than the half would likely come to believe that that had found a fuller version of the penitential umbrens. And of course they would be right. However, so used would they be to viewing the last fourteen chapters as a discrete unit that they would insist on dividing the newly re discovered full form into two books, with the first fifteen chapters comprising a welcome new or seemingly new addition to the Theodorian corpus, and the last fourteen chapters comprising the already familiar half form. They would perhaps also have been helped along in their decision to introduce such division by the mention of a libri secundi in the newly re discovered prologue. Future copies of the now divided full form would preserve the two book format. Centuries later, similar assumptions would be made by 19th and 20th century editors, who come to accept as original the two book format over the 29 chapter format. In 1851, Hermann Wasserschelbin would be convinced by the large number of manuscripts containing the half form of the Penitential Umbrens, as well as by a single 17th century apograph of MSC Flat 4 exhibiting the two book format, that the work must have originally been composed with two distinct parts. He was therefore persuaded to ignore the evidence of his two earliest manuscripts, W7 and W9, and print the Penitential Umbrens with a two book format. 
Subsequent editors would base their editions both on the two book text as established by Wasserschelben and on those manuscripts that were closest or that seemed most ancient to them. These were for Finsterwalder MSV5 and for Haddon Stubbs MSC flat 4, both of which happened to present the penitential umbrance in two books. The textual tradition of the penitential umbrance has not been studied closely since the work of Finsterwalder, and so the evidence or rather the lack thereof for their assumptions about priority of the two-book format have gone unexamined. Some copies of the full form contain a prologue, while others lack the prologue but contain an epilogue instead. No extant copy contains both the prologue and epilogue, a fact that led Finsterwalder to conclude that the epilogue was not original, but was only a later edition intended to replace the prologue. Wilhelm Levis encountered this argument by demonstrating that the prologue and epilogue share remarkably similar style, and therefore must have been composed by the same individual. He also pointed out that the prologue is clearly an original part of the penitential umbrance because c. 7.5 of the text refers to it directly, and there is also an oblique yet obvious reference to the prologue in the first sentence of the epilogue. The presence of the prologue and epilogue in some witnesses and not in others can be explained without resorting to hypotheses about different authorship or about the priority of one and the posteriority of the other. Of the six witnesses to the full form C flat 4, V5, V6, W7, W9, WZ2, all have the prologue except W9 and V6. V6 is fragmentary and preserves no part of the penitential umbrance except the epilogue from Eruditus Illa onwards, while W9 as Levison suggested, probably once contained the prologue on a folio now lost between folds 1V and 2R i.e. between the capitulatio and beginning of the text and this folio has since been cut away. The copies of the prologue in C-flat 4 and WZ2 are incomplete, C-flat 4 due to the loss of a folio, WZ2 due to abbreviation, W9 and V6 are also the only two witnesses to contain the epilogue, yet, in each of the other four witnesses the absence of the epilogue can be explained. Both WZ2 and V5 are fragmentary at their ends, and so may have once contained the epilogue it is impossible now to be sure either way, while both C flat 4 and W7 have as Levison pointed out, simply replaced the prologue with copies of the libelous responsinum so as to make the latter seem like part of the former. It has recently been argued by Michael Glathar that because the epilogue refers disparagingly to certain heretical beliefs associated with two of Boniface's most hated opponents, Adalbert and Clemens, it is most likely a later edition by Boniface or someone in his circle. While the very strong arguments put forward by Levison for the originality of the epilogue render Glathar view of the entire epilogue as a Bonifacian document rather unconvincing, there is no reason that Glathar S argument could not apply specifically to those parts of the epilogue that discuss the heretical beliefs of Adalbert and Clemens. Such discussions are confined entirely to the second half of the epilogue, which in fact reads more like an epistolary dedication than an epilogue, and so may very well be a Bonifacian edition, the Fulda recension. Topic: Sources. Topic: Topic. Manuscripts and transmission Topic. There are numerous extant manuscripts that contain the penitential Theodori or parts thereof. The following tables divide the extant witnesses into umbrance versions, non-umbrance versions, and excerpts. Umbrance versions are further divided into full form and half form. The sigla given below are based on those established by the Korntgen Katya Editions Project for the Corpus Christianorum, Series Latina, Volume 156, a project whose goal is to produce scholarly editions for all major early medieval penitentials. Sigla in parentheses are those used by Paul W. Finsterwalder in his 1929 edition. Umbrens versions Full form 29 chapter version 12 book version half form Topic Non umbrance versions Topic Topic Excerpts Topic 
Note that reports of the presence of penitential umbrents and or canones Gregory excerpts in the 10th century Collectio 77 Capitulorum is found in Heiligenkreuz, Stiftsbibliothek, MS 217 and Munich, Bayerische Staatsbibliothek, CLM 3853 are in error. What such reports are actually referring to is the penitential known as the Capitula Udichorum, previously known as the Poenitential 35 Capitulorum. The following table summarizes the manuscript distribution of the several versions of the Penitential Theodori, not including small excerpts. Topic: <laughs> Summary of manuscript distribution. Topic: Finsterwalder further divided the witnesses of the Penitential Umbrents into two classes. Of the earliest manuscript witnesses, namely those dating to the end of the 8th or beginning of the 9th centuries, none originate in England, the supposed place of origin of the Penitential Theodori. This is not unusual, however, since many early insular texts survive today exclusively in continental witnesses. The majority of extant manuscripts of the Penitential Theodori originate in either Burgundy, northeastern France, and the region of the Rhine and Main rivers. This is significant, as it is these areas in which the Anglo-Saxon mission, specifically that part directed by Boniface, operated in during the first half of the 8th century. The manuscript evidence may thus reflect an early transmission within the scribal centers in the area of this mission, and so may indicate Anglo-Saxon involvement in the Pintential Theodori's early dissemination throughout and or its introduction to the continent. Reception Topic. As discussed above, authorship, the Capitula Dasheriana was perhaps the earliest of the several versions. Based on the close connection between the Capitula Dasheriana and the Collectio Hibernensis, Charles Edwards has argued that the Capitula Dasheriana were produced, perhaps in conjunction with the Hibernensis, in Ireland, whence the text was imported along with the Hibernensis to Brittany and subsequently Francia. Charles Edwards's narrative is both plausible and persuasive, and should probably be accepted as a broad outline, even if some of its details are based more speculative. The most likely candidate for the introduction of the Penitential Umbrents to the continent is Boniface, an Anglo-Saxon missionary and a competent canonist who worked tirelessly to reform the Frankish, German and Bavarian churches in the first half of the 8th century. Boniface knew the Penitential Umbrents, for quotations of it pepper several canonical works that are attributed to him. Boniface also knew, and worked closely with, the papal document known as the Libellus Responsinum. It is no surprise, then, that the earliest manuscript witnesses of the Penitential Umbrents transmit this text in close proximity with the Libellus Responsinum. It was also probably Boniface who was responsible for introducing the Penitential Umbrents to the Corby redaction of the Collectio Canonum Vetus Gallica, in whose creation he seems to have played some part. The Canones Gregory is quoted twice in c. 19 of Pierman's Scarapsis, and on this basis Eckhard Hauswald, the most recent editor of the Scarapsis, was able to date this text to between 725 and 750. The Penitential Umbrents was also used as a source for two early 8th century continental penitentials, namely the Excarpsis Cumiani and the Capitula Udichorum. And several chapters from the half form were added to the text of the Corby redaction of the Collectio Canonum Vetus Gallica, produced in the second quarter of the 8th century. This in addition to the inclusion of nearly the entire latter half equals book two or half form of the Penitential Umbrents in the Vetus Gallica appendix. Altogether, these four works demonstrate that the Penitential Umbrents was available for use on the continent well before the year 750. The Collectio Sangermanensis, dating to the second half of the 8th century and probably also produced at Corby, also draws on the Penitential Umbrents. Towards the end of the 8th century, Paul the Deacon, in his Historia Langobardorum c. 5.30, testified to Theodore's reputation as a promulgator of penitential canons. It is perhaps significant that four of the five Collectio Canonum Vetus Gallica witnesses that contain an appended copy of the half form of the Penitential Umbrents Bridge 7, K1, P10, Street 2 are those from Mordic. S. North French class. 
Moreover, Bridge 7, K1, P10, Street 2 are the only copies of the Collectio Canonum Vetus Gallica to contain a series of chapters drawn from the monastic rules of Columban, Macarius, Basil and Benedict Collectio Canonum Vetus Gallica cc. 46.26-37. These are the only chapters in the entire Collectio Canonum Vetus Gallica tradition to draw on monastic sources. The fifth Collectio Canonum Vetus Gallica witness that contains a copy of the half form of the Penitential Umbrense Saint Three is from Mordic S. South German class, a class that represents a tradition about as old as the North French 1, i.e., the 740 S. Both traditions stem ultimately from a mid 8th century Corby redaction. However, whereas the manuscripts of the North French Tradition preserve more or less intact the series of mainly penitential texts appended to the Collectio Canonum Vetus Gallica Sinodus II Patrici, Penitential Umbrense, etc. Most of the manuscripts of the South German class have modified greatly the arrangement and constituent texts of this appended series. The South German manuscript Street 3 is exceptional, however. As Mordic has shown, it is not only the most faithful witness to the South German Vetus Gallica tradition, it is also the witness with an appendix most resembling that of the North French tradition. It is, for example, the only manuscript from outside the North French group to contain in its appendix the Synodus II Patrici, the Isidorian Epistula ad Massinam, the canons of the Council of Rome in 595 Pope Gregory I's Libellus Synodicus, and the Penitential Umbrense. What might therefore have seemed like an anomaly in the tradition of the Penitential Umbrense plus Collectio Canonum Vetus Gallica combination namely, that an apparently distinctive feature of the North French tradition, the presence of the Penitential Umbrense in the appendix, is also shared by a single South German manuscript in fact is only evidence that the Penitential Umbrense was part of the original series of texts appended to the Corby redaction of the Collectio Canonum Vetus Gallica in the mid-8th century. According to Mordic, Foles 82-195 of P6 which contained the Collectio Canonum Sancti Amandi, the Libellus Responsinum, Pope Gregory II's letter for Boniface beginning Desiderabilum Mihi, the half-form of the Penitential Umbrense, the Canons of the Council of Rome in 721, and the Canons of the Council of Rome in 595 are likely a copy—modified with the help of a Collectio Hispania of either the Gallican or Pseudo-Isidorian form, of Foles 128-266 of P26. Although P39 is above classified as a Collectio Canonum Sancti Amandi witness, and although it exhibits the same penitential umbrense omissions that are characteristic of all Sancti Amandi witnesses namely omission of 16.1-3 and 25.5-26.9, there are nevertheless reasons not to associate the P39 copy of the penitential umbrense with the Sancti Amandi tradition. First, it has long been recognized that the contents of P39 are very similar to those of Berlin, Staatsbibliothek Proischer Kulturbesitz, Phil. 1741, copied in the same place and time as P39 CA 850 times 875 in Reims. However, the section of P39 that contains the Penitential Umbrense fulls 151-166 equals Boringer's Teal 2 is not duplicated in Phil. 1741. What is more, this section of P39, which is self-contained on two gatherings gatherings 21-22, may very well have once been separate from the rest of the manuscript, for it begins with a change of scribal hand, and the text on the last page ends imperfectly full 166 v. C. Keys Metropolitanus Episcopus Nisi Quad Ad Suam Solumodo Proprium Pertinet Parochium Sign Concilio. Foles 151-166 of P39 may therefore have originated as a standalone dossier of materials, and only been joined with the rest of the Codex i.e. the part of the Codex with the Sancti Amandi excerpts at a later time. Editions <inaudible> 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 The Canones Basiliensis has been edited once F.B. Asbach, ed. Das Poenitential Remens und der Sojen. Excursus Cumiani, Überleifering, Quellen und Entwicklung zweier Kontinentaler Bubucher aus der 1. Haft day 8. 
Jarunderts, Regensburg, 1975, Appendix, pp. 80 to 9. A new edition is currently in preparation by Michael D. Elliott. The Canones Cottoniani has been edited once. P. W. Finsterwalder, ed., Die Canones Theodori Cantuariensis und Ihre Überlieferungsformen, Weimar, 1929, pp. 271 84, printing from L. 11. Note, Wasserschelben had previously prepared an implicit edition of the Canones Cottoniani in his Die Busorningen der Abendlandischen Kirch, pp. 181-82, and before that B. Thorpe had collated parts of L. 11 against his edition of the Penitential Pseudo Theodori in his Ancient Laws and Institutes of England, 2 vols London, 1842, pp. 1-62. A new edition is currently in preparation by Michael D. Elliott. The Capitula Dasheriana has been edited three times and reprinted three times. Luke Dashery, ed., Viterum Aliquot Scriptorum. Spicelegium, 13 vols. Paris, 1655-1677, X, pp. 52-62, printing from P36. P. Labby and G. Cossert, eds. Sacrosancta Concilia, ad regium editionum exacta quae nunc quarta parti protit auxur, 17 vols. Paris, 1671 to 1672, v. Appendix, calls 1875 to 1878, reprinting D. Acury's edition. Jacques Petit, ed. Theodori Sanctissimi A. C. Doctissimi Archiepiscopi Cantuariensis Poenitentiale. 2 vols Paris 1677 pp 86 to 7 reprinting selected canons from D Acury's edition and collating these with readings from his own edition of the half form of the penitential umbrance L. F. J. De la Barre, ed. Spicelegium sive collectio viterum aliquot scriptorum qui in Galliae bibliothesis deliciwarent 3 vols Paris 1723 IPP 486 to 90 reprinting D Acury S edition with variant readings supplied from P22 via a transcript prepared by Edmund Martin and with the Canons Adomnani appended to the end F W H Wasserschelben ed Die Busorningen der Abendlandischen Kirche Halle 1851 PP 145 to 60 reprinting De la Bar S reprint of D Acury's edition, but also using transcripts of P36 and P22 prepared by F. H. Nust. P. W. Finsterwalder, ed., Die Canones Theodori Cantuariensis und Ihre Überlieferungsformen Weimar, 1929, pp. 239-52, printing from P22, with variant readings supplied from P36. A new edition based principally on P36 is currently in preparation by Michael D. Elliott. The Canones Gregory has been edited five times and reprinted once. F. W. H. Wasserschelben, Betrage zur Geschichte der Vorgrationischen Kirchenrechtsquellen Leipzig, 1839, pp. 119-24, printing a selection of excerpts from me one that include chapters from the Canones Gregory. F. Kunstmann, ed., Die Lateinischen Ponitentialbücher der Angelsaxon, MIT Geschichtlicher Einleitung, Mainz, 1844, pp. 129-41, printing from M14. F. W. H. Wasserschelben, ed., Die Busorningen der Abendlandischen Kirche, Halle, 1851, pp. 160-80, reprinting Kunstmann's edition, and supplying variant readings from P12. K. Hildenbrand, ed., Untersuchungen über die Germanischen Ponitentialbücher Würzburg, 1851, pp. 126-29, printing two short series of canons from M6 and M2, each of which includes excerpts from the Canones Gregory. H. J. Schmitz, ed., Die Busbutcher und das Kanonische Busverfahren, Nach Handschriftlichen Quellen Dargestelt Düsseldorf, 1898, pp. 523-42, printing from P12, and supplying variant readings from M14 as well as other penitential texts including the Capitula da Shuriana and the Penitential Umbrance. P. W. Finsterwalder, ed., Die Canones Theodori Cantuariensis und Ihre Überlieferungsformen Weimar, 1929, pp. 253-70, printing from P27, with variant readings supplied from an M14 and P12, as well as from L1, M6, and Mi1. 
A new edition based principally on M14 is currently in preparation by Michael D. Elliott. The full form of the Penitential Umbrense has been edited eight times and reprinted once. In 29 chapter form, J. W. Bickel, Review of Wasserschelben's Betrage, in Kritische Jarbucher für Deutsche Rechtswissenschaft 5 pp. 390–403, at pp. 399–400, printing the prologue, register 28 chapter form and epilogue from W9 and WZ2. K. Hildenbrand, ed., Untersuchungen über die Germanischen Ponitentialbücher Würzburg, 1851, pp. 86–125, printing from W9 and supplying variants from WZ2, M17 as well as other penitential texts including the Capitula Dasheriana p. 36, Canones Gregory M6, M2, M14, Me1, the latter two is reported by Kunstmann and Wasserschulben, and both the Canones Cotaniani L11 and Penitential Umbra C flat 4 as reported in the limited collation notes to the edition of the Penitential Pseudo Theodori by B. Thorpe, Ancient Laws and Institutes of England, 2 vols, London, 1842, pp. 1 to 62. Note, Hildenbrand's edition numbers only 28 chapters, because his main witness for the full form W9 is divided into 28 chapters. Note 2, Hildenbrand prints only the first part of the prologue, because his single witness to this part of the full form WZ2 is incomplete. A new edition based principally on W7 is currently in preparation by Michael D. Elliott. In two-book form, FWH. Wasserschelben, ed., Die Bussorningen der Abendlandischen Kirche Halle, 1851, pp. 182-219, printing mainly from W9 but with the prologue printed from W7 and supplying variants from W7, WZ2, and Paris, Bibliothèque Nationale, Lot, 13452 an early modern apograph of C-flat 4, as well as several witnesses of the half-form. H. J. Schmitz, ed., Die Busbutcher und die Busdiscipline der Kirche, Nach Handschriftlichen Quellen Dargestelt, Mainz, 1883, pp. 524 50, claiming to print from W7, but actually reprinting Wasserschelben's edition. A. W. Haddon and W. Stubbs, eds., Councils and Ecclesiastical Documents Relating to Great Britain and Ireland, 3 vols. Volume. Two in two parts. Oxford, 1869 to 1873, 3 pp. 173 to 204. Printing from C flat 4, with variant readings supplied from Wasserschelben's edition. Note: C flat 4 was previously collated as N by B. Thorpe against his edition of the Penitential Pseudo Theodori in his Ancient Laws and Institutes of England, two vols. London, 1840, 2 pp. 1 to 62. H. J. Schmitz, ed., Die Busbutcher und das Kanonische Busverfahren, Nach Handschriftlichen Quellen Dargestelt, Dusseldorf, 1898, pp. 544 56, printing cc. 1 16.3 only from W7, and supplying variant readings from W9, WZ2, and Paris, Bibliothèque Nationale, Lot, 13452, an early modern apograph of C flat 4. P. W. Finsterwalder, ed., Die Canones Theodori Cantuariensis und Ihre Überlieferungsformen Weimar, 1929, pp. 285-334, printing his recension based on most of the extant witnesses. Just the epilogue Amai, ed., Nova Patrum Bibliotheca, Vol. 7, Rome, 1854, Part 3, p. 76, printing the fragmentary text of V6, the half-form of the Penitential Umbrance equals cc. 16.4-25.4 plus cc. 26-27-29 plus c. 13 has been edited twice and reprinted twice. Jacques Petit, ed., Theodori Sanctissimi A.C. Doctissimi Archiepiscopi Cantuariensis Poenitential. Two vols, Paris, 1677, pp. 1 to 14, printing from p. 25 and p. 7. Note: Petit also produced a partial recension of the half form, pp. 88 to 94, by collating his edition against readings found in other authorities, Burchard, Gratian, etc. Nicholas J. Poisson, Delectus Actorum Ecclesia Universalis, Seu Nova Summa Conciliorum, Epistolarum, Decretorum SS, Pontificum, Capitularium, etc. Two vols, Lyon, 1706, 2, calls 2274-2279, reprinting Pettit's editions. 
J. P. Migni, ed. Petrologia Cursus Completus C. Bibliotheca Universalis Omnium SS, Patrum, Doctorum Scriptorum qua Ecclesiasticorum qui ab avo apostoloca ad usque innocenti three tempora floruerent. Series Secunda equals Latina. 217 vols, Paris, 1844 to 1864. XCIX calls 927A 936C, reprinting Pettit's edition. H. J. Schmitz, ed., Die Busbutcher und das Kanonische Busverfahren, Nach Handschriftlichen Quellen Dargestelt, Dusseldorf, 1898, pp. 566 80, printing from B5, and supplying variant readings from several other half form witnesses, as well as W7 and M17. Topic. Notes Topic. Topic. Bibliography Topic. F. B. Asbach, ed., Das Poenitential Remens und der Sojan. Excursus Cumiani, Überleifering, Quellen und Entwicklung zweier Kontinentaler Bubucher aus der 1. Half Day 8. Jarunderts Regensburg, 1975. T. M. Charles Edwards. The Penitential of Theodore and the Udicha Theodori. In Archbishop Theodore, Commemorative Studies on His Life and Influence, ed. M. Lappage, Cambridge Studies in Anglo-Saxon England 11 Cambridge, 1995, 141-74. P. W. Finsterwalder, ed., Die Canones Theodori Cantuariensis und Ihre Überlieferungsformen, Weimar, 1929. R. Fletchner, An Insular Tradition of Ecclesiastical Law, 5th to 8th Century, in Anglo Saxon, Irish Relations Before the Vikings, eds. J. Graham Campbell and M. Ryan, Proceedings of the British Academy 157, Oxford, 2009, 23 to 46. R. Fletchner, the Making of the Canons of Theodore", in Parisha 17–18 2003–2004, pp. 121–43. A. J. Franzen, The Literature of Penance in Anglo-Saxon England New Brunswick, N. J., 1983, pp. 62–69, at Passam. A. W. Haddon and W. Stubbs, eds., Councils and Ecclesiastical Documents Relating to Great Britain and Ireland, 3 vols. Volume. Two in two parts, Oxford, 1869 to 1873, 3, pp. 173 to 213. R. Hagenmuller, Die Überlieferung der Beda und Egbert Zugeschriebenen Busbutcher, Europäische Hochschulschriften, Rehi 3, Geschichte und Ihre Hilfswissenschaften 461, Frankfurt am Main, 1991. L. Korntgen, Studien zu den Quellen der Frühmittelalterlichen Bubucher. Quellen und Forschungen zum Reck im Mittelalter 7 Sigmaringen, 1993. R. Katja. Penitential Theodori. In Handwerterbuch zur Deutschen Rechtsgeschichte. 3. Band, List Protonitar, E. D. S. A. Erler and E. Kaufmann, with W. Stamler and R. Schmidt Wiegand, Berlin, 1984, calls 1413-16. J. T. McNeil and H. M. Gamer, Medieval Handbooks of Penance, a translation of the Principal Libri Poenitentialis and selections from related documents New York, 1938, pp. 58-60 and 179-215. R. Means, Het Tripartite Botibok. Overlevering and Betekennis van Vrogmiddelus Bichtvorschriften Met Editi en Vertelling van Veer Tripartita, Middelus Studies and Bronen 41 Hilversum, 1994, pp. 30-6. H. Mordic, Bibliotheca Capitularium Regum Francorum Manuscripta. Überliefering und Traditionsusamenhang der Frankischen Herschurlasi, MGH Hilfsmittel 15, Munich, 1995. H. Mordic, Kirchen Richt und Reform im Frankenreich, die Collectio Vetus Gallica, die Alteste Systematische Kanonesemling des Frankischen Galen. Studien und Edition, Beatridge zur Geschichte und Quellenkunde des Mittelalters 1, Berlin, 1975. F. W. H. Wasserschelben, ed., Die Busorningen der Abendlandischen Kirche, Halle, 1851, pp. 13 37 and 145 219. Further reading Topic 
Eliot's synoptic edition of all five versions of the Udicha Theodorikanones Basiliensis Eliot's edition in progress of the Canones Basiliensis A diplomatic transcription of the copy of the Canones Basiliensis in Basel, Universitatsbibliothek, NI 1 No. 3 Canones Cotoniani Eliot's edition in progress of the Canones Cotoniani a diplomatic transcription of the copy of the Canones Cotoniani in Paris, Bibliothèque Nationale, Lot. 12021, Fols 33-356 Capitula Dasharyana Eliot's edition in progress of the Capitula Dasharyana Wasserschelbin's 1851 edition of the Capitula Dasharyana Google Books De La Barre. S. 1723 reprint of D. Akeri's edition of the Capitula Dasharyana Google Books. Labi Cossert. S. 1671 reprint of D. Akeri's edition of the Capitula Dasharyana Google Books. D. Akeri. S. 1669 edition of the Capitula Dasharyana Google Books. Canones Gregory. Eliot's edition in progress of the Canones Gregory. A diplomatic transcription of the copy of the Canones Gregory in Munich, Bayerische Staatsbibliothek, CLM 14780, Fols 1 53, where it is combined with the libellus responsinum. Schmitz's 1898 edition of the Canones Gregory, Internet Archive. Wasserschelben's 1851 reprint of the Kunstmann's edition of the Canones Gregory, Google Books. Kunstmann's 1844 edition of the Canones Gregory Google Books Penitential Umbrens Eliot's edition in progress of the Penitential Umbrens in 29 chapter form A diplomatic transcription of the copy of the Penitential Umbrens 29 chapter form in Vienna Österreichische Nationalbibliothek Lot 2195 Fols 2v-46 where it is combined with the libellus responsinum in a 49 chapter work Hildenbrand's 1851 edition of the Penitential Umbrens in 29 chapter form Google Books Bickel's 1839 edition of the preface, register and epilogue of the Penitential Umbrens Google Books McNeil Gamer's 1938 English translation of the Penitential Umbrens Google Books, preview Schmitz's 1898 partial edition CC, 1-16 3 of the Penitential Umbrens in two book form Internet Archive Schmitz's 1883 reprint of Wasserkelben's edition of the Penitential Umbrens in two book form Google Books Haddon Stubbs's 1873 edition of the Penitential Umbrens in two book form Google Books Mai's 1854 edition of the epilogue of the Penitential Umbrens from V6 Google Books Wasserschelben's 1851 edition of the Penitential Umbrens in two book form Google Books Penitential Umbrens half form Schmitz's 1898 edition of the half form of the Penitential Umbrens Google Books Pettit's 1677 edition of the half form of the Penitential Umbrens Google Books <laughs>